Now on Talking Solutions, we've got Linda Tache in from the Grant to Gift Autism Foundation. This is your third visit yes, in with me. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> April is Autism Awareness Month. Correct, yes. So it's a great time to talk about the issue anyway. Plus, there's a big event that we're always involved with with yes. Beasley at the end of April every year. The 5K Autism Race for Hope and the Fun Walk. And yes. it's coming up on Saturday the 30th yes. at Town Square, which is where you did it last year, right? Absolutely, yes. We've had it there every year since we started because they're so great to work with. Beautiful location. (laughs) You can't go wrong. It's going to be a great event. We'll tell you more about that as we go along, but it's one of those things you bring out the family. Beautiful surroundings, as we mentioned, and from about seven o'clock on a Saturday morning when it starts to about noontime when it wraps up. Fun. Yes. For a good cause. And as we mentioned, it is Autism Awareness Month. If Linda, you would share. I know the story. I love the story. And I always get a little more out of your story every time I talk with you. But for people who haven't been with us before, we are talking specifically about autism. The organization that you helped found that you are executive director for is the Grant to Gift Autism Foundation. There is a reason why it's named Grant to Gift. Yes. The inspiration behind Grant to Gift is actually my son, Grant, who is now, believe it or not, going on 15. Whoa. I know. (laughs) (laughs) That happens really fast. Really, really fast. And autism was becoming an epidemic. We're a lot further ahead today, obviously, than we were a while ago. And Grant was showing signs back in 2002. So I knew before he was a year old, something wasn't right. And I had no experience with anything about autism, nothing in my family at the time. So it was really hard to figure out what was going on. I'd ask my pediatrician, you know, why is he doing this? What's going on? And the pediatrician really wasn't educated. And that's still very common today. We're trying to change that. But it was just really hard because Grant had a lot of behavior issues. It was very restricting for us. I mean, there was a lot of times like I couldn't even go to the grocery store to just do regular daily stuff. So it was really, really hard. And then finally, around five and a half, which is kind of scary because that's a lot of years of when I first realized something wasn't right. He finally was diagnosed with autism and some other neurodevelopmental issues like sensory issues. And then he even has ADHD, which is kind of a secondary diagnosis. But it was bittersweet because I found out what he had. But then now what? And that, again, was another issue or challenge that I went through is that I knew what he had, but there were no resources or support systems in place here in Southern Nevada that I could really plug into. And I was a single mom. I had no family here. It was very challenging and has been quite the journey. So through all those experiences, I learned so much. And I've always been a volunteer at heart. I've always been a servant. And I was like, I have to take these lemons and make lemonade. (laughs) Got to make something positive out of all of this. (laughs) Yeah. So really, that was working up to when I started Grand to Gift. Speaking of start, if I take you all the way back to when you were expecting. Yeah. Grant, your first child? Yes. So you didn't have any background on having a baby before? I had no nieces or nephews, no other babies to compare it to. You got this new experience coming on. What expectations did you have before you ever had him? That's a great question. Just like everyone that's having children, you have hopes and dreams and aspirations. Like, you know, you think of, oh, I can hardly wait. What sports are they going to play? Or what activities are they going to be good at? And then high school and dating and, you know, driving and just even then going to college. And then you're thinking, okay, they're going to get married someday and they're going to have children. And you just think of all these wonderful dreams and aspirations, which I called out expectations. (laughs) Those are the things I think that the average parent goes through. So when your child has something going on that's not typical, and then you find out, it's pretty devastating. It's almost like you're going through a grieving process because all those hopes and dreams that you had, pretty much they die, they're gone. And you don't know, like, especially if you don't understand what's going on, you don't know. You think it's over. You think, okay, they're not going to have a life. They're not going to be happy, healthy, productive children. So really, that's the thing that went through my mind was I felt like the son that I had 
almost was gone, if that makes sense. Well, it's just that you had all these dreams. Yes. For yes. all the wonderful life experiences yes. that you expected yes. Grant to have as yes. he grew. Yes. And now all of a sudden you get this diagnosis of autism, mm-hmm. which is cloudy and murky in your mind anyway. Mm-hmm. You're not real sure. When I've dealt with health issues, mm-hmm. I look for any kind of hope to yes. grab onto. And I would think about the only hope you'd have in a diagnosis of autism is it's not fatal. Right. And although it's wonderful that it's not a fatal type condition, it's also not fixable. Right. There's no known cure. The only evidence base that we have is because it's a neurodevelopmental condition, the earlier they can get diagnosed with the proper treatments, their quality of life increases greatly. That's why it's so important that if you have questions, you need to get answers as soon as possible. So like my story, I told you we were delayed in getting him diagnosed and Grant's doing wonderful, but he maybe could have been a little further along. So that's really the only evidence base theories that we know is that the sooner they get diagnosed and treated, the more independence and better quality of life they can have. Well, there's a lot of interesting things that we're going to bring up during our talk today with Linda Taché, the executive director, the founder of the Grant Gift Autism Foundation. Being that it is Autism Awareness Month, getting people aware of what autism is, is a big part of it. It's much more common than people realize. Because over the years, we've heard different numbers. I'm sure you've been hyper aware of it. First, it was what, one in 128, and then it's one in 68, but yeah. it happens mostly with boys like yes. Grant, right? Yes, yes. It's interesting, and I can think of all the special ed classes and treatment programs my son's been in since he was young. I could probably count on one hand the number of girls that have been in his classes, and it's funny because even through our center, the boys far outweigh the girls, and we're always trying to find those girls because it helps with just the inclusion and everything, but yes, it does. And they don't know why it affects boys more. There's theories that have to do with like the chromosomes because boys have, I think it's like the double X or I don't know. But I know it, there's an XY it, thing, going, XY going, on thing going on. But that's the theories that we've heard about that. So again, it's a mystery. And that's why the puzzle is the symbol, the puzzle pieces, because right. we're still trying to figure out this puzzle. <laughs> well, and the numbers as yes. far as here in Southern Nevada, yes. they're higher, right? They, they really are. In fact, it's funny when Grant was first diagnosed, diagnosed back in 06, the numbers were 1 in 150. And then like you said, it kept going up 1 in 72. And then the last year, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, did is say it's, it's 1 in 68. That's nationally, on average, 1 in 68 children are on the spectrum somewhere. But in Nevada, as a whole, we have over 7,000 that are documented. That's under 21, children and youth. That's not counting the ones that haven't been diagnosed yet, or they're in private school, or, you know, they're they're just not counted through the school district. But I would say down here in Southern Nevada, we have close to 5,000 kiddos and youth that are living with some form. And it's not just the kids, the 5,000 approximately that we have in Southern Nevada. It's their families, their parents, their siblings, all of their relatives, all of the people who interact with that child. Yes. And even the grandparents. The grandparents have a lot of things they work through because it's a different generation and just the false sense of responsibility, like what did I do or not do? And parents even... They always take it on themselves. (laughs) You did that too, didn't you? I was the Mm -hmm. worst. I was my own worst enemy in that, yes. Our numbers here in Southern Nevada are actually higher. Do you think that the numbers going up maybe is partially due to better diagnosing Mm -hmm. the autism spectrum? Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely a big part of it. And then also... So the definition has broadened. So the DSM-5 is the medical journal that diagnoses mental and physical conditions and stuff. It's broadened. So it's that. And then we're also catching them earlier. We're really focusing on the early intervention piece. I work on a committee through the state called Learn the Signs Act Early. And that's a partnership with the AUCD and then also the Center for Disease Control. It's an initiative that we're trying to educate people. So it's more people getting diagnosed. And then professionals are now getting more educated. Educated, but there is something else going on too. So it's not just that. They think it's something environmental, but again, there's millions and millions being spent in research worldwide. We're just trying to balance that research and treatment because the research is great, but then we also have to treat the kids. Well, and you're pushing it as fast as you can yeah. because mm-hmm. in the midst of this, more kids being diagnosed mm-hmm. with autism, hopefully earlier because the younger, the better as far as their ability to function yeah. as they go through their lives. So we're trying 
trying to get them diagnosed as early as possible. Some people might not even know what does the phrase autism spectrum mean. The spectrum means that there's a wide variety of differences or how it looks between each child. It's interesting. There's a saying that you've met one person or child with autism, you've met one person or child. They all have the same criteria as far as like social deficits, speech and language delays, and repetitive behaviors. Those are the fundamental things that autism is. But every child shows the symptoms different. They're unique in and of themselves. And then also there's the whole intellectual IQ piece. About 25% of people diagnosed with autism do have a lower IQ. They're coined with an intellectual disability. So you're looking at that whole like intellectual piece, the cognitive, but then also in some children, because it affects the different parts of the brain, some children can't speak. Yeah, I was so, thinking nonverbal for non- some of these exactly. kids. Exactly. And we're learning a lot now. Like there used to be less services for nonverbal kids. But what we're learning with the adaptive technology, there's a lot of great apps out there through Apple or whoever, and then even the iPads, they can really still communicate. So that doesn't mean if they don't talk, they have a low IQ. There's just so much we're finding out that's so interesting, but that's really the spectrum. Technology is yes. amazing. Yes. Linda Tache, the Executive Director with Grant and Gift Autism Foundation, in with us today on Talking Solutions, named for your son, Grant. He's going to be what, 15? 15. Whoa. And Terry, I know it's been a while since you've seen him. He's 6'3". <laughs> well, obviously, it's not affecting his height. No. <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things that I'm seeing, too, is, and I would imagine as much as you work with autism in general, you've also heard how creative the solutions are that some of these autistic children are coming up with. And this is exciting. They've taken kids with autism. They have been presented with challenges, and they're able to solve them, but they think outside the box. So they come up with some other creative way that people who are, I don't even want to say normal, (laughs) the rest of us would not think of. They just don't think in the same way as we do. And in this case, it's exciting. Yes, it really, really, really is. I think part of it is that we have inhibitions as we get older. You know, if you have that neurotypical wiring, we have a filter or we think, no, we shouldn't say this. We limit ourselves to even thinking outside the box. And a lot of our children, that's one of the things is that part of their brain isn't there. They say, if I think it, I'm going to figure it out. regardless of whether society thinks it's great or not. So I believe that's part of it. But their brains, I believe they tap into a part of their brain too that maybe we don't use as well. And it's just amazing how brilliant they can be on any level. And they've said that Albert Einstein actually probably would have been diagnosed on the spectrum when he was a genius. They've said even like Bill Gates and Steven Spielberg are probably on that spectrum somewhere and they're creative geniuses. And I think that's the important piece, Terry, that you just made me think of is that they have so much potential. So it's not a death sentence. No. It's the hope in the future. If we help them reach their full potential, that there's some great things that can happen. We have to not be afraid yes. of the diagnosis of autism. Just say, well, I need to approach it from a different perspective now. And I need to go out and find the supporting services and the other individuals who also are dealing with autism with their families. Share these stories and find those commonalities and get to those services to help the child who's diagnosed with autism maximize their potential. Because I think what we're seeing now is the early stages of autistic individuals being able to enrich our lives with their unique view on things. Yes. Kind of exciting, isn't it? very cool. (laughs) Something I need to point out to you, (laughs) if you don't watch it, there's a show that we've been watching for years. Elementary is a very cleverly written show, a detective show on CBS. Sherlock Holmes' new romantic interest is a girl with autism. Really? She's brilliant. She works for a tech company. She's amazing. (laughs) She is verbal. Right. In a different way. But they are making her a character on this show now. You've got that to watch cool. it. I love stuff like that. Yeah. That's his new love interest. Yeah. He's intrigued. She's special That's to him. Awesome. In so many ways. That's so awesome. I definitely will watch that. Thank you for letting me know. You got to watch it and then yes. I got to get your feedback yes. on it. The <laughs> Elementary TV Fan Club or something on Facebook. I love it. Linda Tache is with us with the Grant a Gift Autism Foundation. You had faced challenges as a new first time mom. 
mom with really no support services around you and your doctor was not well educated. We're starting to get the word out on it. Yes, absolutely. And you know, one of the really great things that's happening right now is UNLV has started a new medical school. I saw some of this on your website. (laughs) We are in the works to have a new partnership with them. And it's going to be very exciting because we will be actually our center in collaboration with the School of Medicine, will be training and educating the students and other professionals in the community to really help them understand and recognize signs. And then even when they do recognize the signs, then what? Like, where can they refer them? Where do I go now? Exactly. So we believe that is going to be changing. That's going to be shifting where the pediatricians will understand more and be able to help with that whole process. And then they'll be able to refer them to our center And we're going to have education, research, and we're going to expand. We're expanding our services. We're going to basically have a one-stop shop for like birth to adulthood. So that whole lifespan, so that no matter where that family's at in the process, they'll be able to contact us and we can help them fit in somewhere, either at our center or somewhere else in the community. So it's really exciting. Well, I know that we had, what is it, a center with Turo University in Henderson. They've done some things in autism awareness and autism treatment. But as far as UNLV and the medical school, which I understand is on target to open on time, that's very yes. exciting. Yes. But all of the medical professionals, no matter where they end up, as they go through the system now with UNLV from the start, it sounds like they're going to be well educated on autism. Yes. Absolutely. And in fact, the center collaboration is going to be part of their practice plan through the School of Medicine. So it'll be a rotation. So it's really exciting because then again, you know, even if someone doesn't specialize in like developmental pediatrics, they still have to have some working knowledge of what that is so they can refer out to that developmental pediatrician or other professionals. And it's really important to note too that autism is so big that not one entity or organization can do everything. So we all work together in the community and we've had a really good working relationship with Toro over the years. They're fabulous. In fact, we've been clients of them. And so it's really neat because their occupational therapy students would even be able to get trained or field experience in our center as well. So the community is coming together to really make that difference because it's so big. But all of this has a cost involved. Yes. And the cost is everything. It's time. It's money. But we're excited because obviously our events, especially the 5K that's coming up, all the proceeds from that 5K is going to stay here locally and support this new center and continue growing our programs and services. It's really exciting and we need that help. If we didn't have the help of the community and like you having us on to get the word out, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So it's really important if people can to step up and come alongside and help. Well, it's going to be fun. (laughs) Every year you've had this event at yes. Town Square. Yes. What's going to happen on Saturday, April 30th? It is such a fun day, and it's great for the kids. First of all, we started this a couple years ago. We have the kids run. Registration starts at 7 a.m. Then at 8 a.m. is our opening ceremony. So we're really excited to announce that in our opening ceremony, we're actually going to have a special appearance by the Blue Man Group. Oh, I love that. <laughs> They're fun. <laughs> they are awesome. And I have a funny story for you. Our kids love them and they don't talk. It's so cute. It's like, perfect for nonverbal. It's perfect because I've had children that we see ask if they have autism. <laughs> Oh, I like that. (laughs) It's so cool. We've had a great partnership with the Blue Man Group, so they'll be making a fun appearance. You'll have to come and see what that is. Then we'll have the kids run, and every child that does the kids run gets a medal. It's just so cute. They feel so special. Then, of course, we have the regular 5K race, and then we also have the fun walk. Works for me. (laughs) Me too. I'm right there with you. I'll pay someone to run in my place. But anyways, that's pretty much the morning portion, but then we also have live music, and we have a kid zone. It's really cool. Sports Social comes out and does this kind of like skateboard pipe. There's little scooters. We also have a little soccer area that's sponsored by Azul Blue and lots and lots of vendors. So I think one of the most important things is that we have probably close to 30 to 40 community partners out there with certain activities, but they're there to give families free information. So even if a family can't afford to register for the actual event, they can still come and go to the resource 
Farmers Fair and just have fun and get information and know that they belong. So it's a great day. I love it. I have so much fun. <laughs> if you want to find out information, by the way, it's presented by our station here yes, with Beasley Media yes, Group. Yes, thank 1027 you. The Coyote involved yeah. again this year yeah. and proudly so. They'll be on site. Yes. Among all of your different community Absolutely. vendors. Absolutely. It's just going to be a great day and it is Saturday, April 30th. It's at Town Square. I love that place. And yeah. if somebody was wanting to get signed up, they can either go to our website at grantagiftfoundation.org on our events page and then they can either register as an individual or you get a discount if you start a team. They can build a team and then each person that signs up also gets to create a fundraising page that they can customize and send to all their friends and family across the world that helps raise money. And this is a cool thing. We also have, if someone's out of town or is just too lazy to come, we have a sleep in for autism. <laughs> <laughs> so we're taking all excuses away. That's an and interesting they get a angle. shirt. They get a shirt so they can sleep in. For Could autism. it be a night shirt? Could you do that sure, next year? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I'll jot that down. I'll submit that to our event committee. Absolutely. All of the information that will be available at Town Square for this big event on Saturday, April 30th. It's important not only for people who have kids being diagnosed or having been diagnosed with autism and dealing with it in the family, but for the teachers and the neighbors and the relatives and the yeah. friends because autism is being diagnosed so often now mm-hmm. these days. I'm not going to say chances are. You know somebody in your circle who deals with autism, whether you're aware of it or not. And Linda, having had this diagnosis with Grant yeah. as far as autism in his case, your diagnosis, I'm thinking, is coming up on almost a decade yeah. since you found out. If you could share any information for the people in a restaurant or in a grocery store or somewhere like that who are not normally around someone with autism yes, and a situation maybe arises, what do we do? How would you ask us to yeah. deal with an autistic family Yes, in our midst. That's a really wonderful question to ask because that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we face because, again, there's usually no physical appearance of it. And so it looks like it's all behavioral. I would say if you're in a restaurant, you're on an airplane or, you know, out in the public and there's a child screaming uncontrollably or throwing themselves on the ground, I would just say don't judge. Please do not judge. If you feel uncomfortable with the situation, try to move away from it. Or if you feel comfortable, just ask the person, the parents, is there anything I can do to help you? Because really, it's so horrifying as a parent when you're having to deal with that. It just makes it worse if people are judging or even making comments about it. And I would say even for the employees, too, that work in all these areas, again, don't judge, but just ask, is there anything I can do to help you? And, you know, a lot of times as parents will say, I can't be here anymore. We'll, you know, take our food to go. I've done that plenty of times and left. But that's that's what I would say is please do not judge. Don't give looks. Just either peacefully move or ask, what can I do to help you? And then that parent can let you know. If you even said, oh, thank you so much, yes, but no, I exactly. appreciate you asking. Exactly. Just the fact that they reached out yes. would mean a lot. Yep, absolutely. Kids with autism, I know we had talked as we have discussions ongoing about Grant and his autism. What's he doing these days at six foot three in height and about 15? He is so funny. Grant has his own YouTube channel. He loves to make videos. He edits videos. And it's really interesting because he has this whole network and it's a social network of friends around the world. Like in England and in the United States, they all Skype or get on Google Hangout. They will help each other with their videos, with the technology of it. And a lot of them always come to Grant because he's really good at what he does. He loves to edit and create special effects. And so I try to get him all the equipment necessary (laughs) so that he could do that. But I think he has over 500 followers on his YouTube. So he's doing something cool, I guess. (laughs) You could link that on your website, probably. I probably should. Yeah, Yeah. I think that would be kind of (laughs) cool to say, you know, especially when somebody comes to your website, which is Mm -hmm. grantagiftautismfoundation.com. 
autismchannel.org. Maybe it's somebody who is not familiar with autism. When they find that YouTube channel and some of those videos that Grant has turned out on his own as a teenager, it would make them feel comforted to go, you know what? These kids can do a lot of stuff. Yeah, they're smart. They are very smart. Don't underestimate them. In fact, he had to teach me how to use my iPhone. That's when I first Kids always do that. I know. I don't know how they know. It's so weird. They're born with some chip in there. Well, it's called I Have No Fear (laughs) of Technology because it did not grow up after I grew up. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. Pretty much. We were already here before the technology, so when it comes along, we're like, woo. Uh (laughs) For them, no fear whatsoever. If you compared the way that you felt as a new mom, Grant is five and a half when you get the diagnosis of autism, Mm -hmm. and how all those dreams that you had kind of just went poof to the way that you feel now about what Grant has achieved. Now, CCSD, the school district, they're pretty helpful. Is he mainstream now? He's no longer in a special needs class? Or how's that working for him at this stage of his education? Sure, that's a great question. CCSD, through the IDEA Act, they have a special education program. Grant actually went through special ed. That's always the goal with the children. They start off in a self-contained class, and then the goal is to transfer them into a regular setting. Yeah, the regular population of kids. Exactly. So Grant was in the special ed class until he was in fifth grade. And then in middle school, he actually transitioned into regular ed. And he still needed some support. That's the important thing is that they encouraged the transition, but then still provided supports like accommodations for him. So now he's in ninth grade and he's doing really, really, really well. It's interesting because, you know, our children are successful in all different environments. He had started regular high school this year and it was a little overwhelming for him because for any kid. (laughs) Yes, thank you. Even for me, I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. He was starting to kind of fall through the cracks with a lot of the classes and stuff. And so there's a charter school out there called Beacon Academy. Mm -hmm. It's actually an online school, but then it also has a brick and mortar where you can go and get that individualized support. So we actually transitioned him to that second quarter of this year. And it's working really well for him because of the technology piece. He's learning more. He retains more that way than just the talking instruction. But to answer your question, he was able to mainstream into the real life setting because of all the supports that were given to us throughout the years there. That is great. And I get the high school thing. I went through it too. We all do. Yes. Now working with Beacon Academy, Mm -hmm. it's a smaller setting. Yes. A little bit more cocoon, a lot more online. That works for him. And that's the whole thing with autism. Every child is different. They are. So the main thing is to find out what works for them. Yes. And having choices. I think that's the most important thing. Like you said, it's not one size fits all. It's whatever works for them. So we need to have more options like this in the community that parents can see what works and what doesn't. Grant a gift, autismfoundation.org has all kinds of information. I think his videos one of these days are going to end up on your website (laughs) with his YouTube channel. You can be a fan. Linda Tache with Grant as your son early in the diagnosis of autism. I'm sure it was very, very gray, very murky. I don't see a lot in the future. What do you see now? Oh, my goodness. I see a brilliant child that wants to live on his own. I hope he can drive someday. He has aspirations of driving. He thinks he wants to go to college. And I actually see him getting married someday and me being a grandma. There's so much hope for him and there's light for him. And so I see some great things down the road. And he's just made my life so special and so wonderful that I can't imagine what it would have been like if he didn't have autism. (laughs) These dreams that we're talking about, driving and college and getting married and grandchildren, these are the kind of dreams that you had originally. Yes. Before he came along. Yes. Before the autism diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You're just taking a very interesting path to get there. Yep. That is so true. The Grant to Gift Autism Foundation. We're going to have the links and everything on our Talking Solutions Facebook page, along with a podcast of this interview. We always say, what can we do to help? Mm 
getting involved in the event yeah. on Saturday, April 30th at Town Square. The 5K Autism Race for Hope and Fun Walk. It's a Saturday morning from about 7 a.m. to noon with all kinds of fun things for the whole family. You can find out about it on the website, grantagiftautismfoundation.org. What have I missed, Linda? Oh, Tell me. Oh, my goodness. The other way that they can reach out to us, too, even if they need some information on programs, is call our office at 702-564-2453. 702-564-2453. That will also be on our Facebook page. Linda Tache, it's always great to talk with you. We always get new insights into life with autism when you come to visit Thank us on Talking you. Solutions. It's such a pleasure. We love having you here. You're going to come back and give us updates, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Teenage boy, are you kidding? <laughs> come back and tell us stories. That sounds good. <laughs> Talking Solutions is a production of the Community Relations Department here at Beasley Media Group, Las Vegas. Get more information on today's topic on our Talking Solutions page on Facebook, where you will also find links and a podcast of today's show. Thanks for listening, and have a great week.